Well, I don't even remember his name. As a matter of fact, I don't remember much about him except one conversation I had, just one conversation. He was uh, my next-door neighbor, so to speak, in college. We were in rooms right beside each other. And I remember this one conversation where he was sitting on his bed, cross-legged, with his guitar uh, in his lap, and he was uh, playing, and he was you know, like not paying attention much to me, but we're having a conversation about his finances. Because I discovered, he's, he, somehow in the conversation, I remember him telling me, I don't really have enough money to pay for my room and board here. We both were at Moody Bible Institute. The nice thing about that school is everybody gets a f- uh, full-ride scholarship, uh, tuition-free at Moody, but you still have to pay for room and board, and he didn't have any money to pay for it. And he told me that. So I, st- I remember standing there, and he was just kind of playing his guitar, and I said, well, what, why don't you get a job? He goes, no, I'm not going to get a job. And I said, well, why aren't you going to get a job? And he said, well, I'm just going to trust God. I said, you know, they're hiring people down at the food service, right? He goes, yeah, I know. Just, I just believe God's going to... Now, what's your reaction to that? No, I know. It's, you know, I, I'm getting the same reaction every time, every sermon I've given here. Some of you are going, well, okay, well, that... He's trusting God, he, his faith, right? But, but it's stupid, too, at the same time, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, matters of faith, we're thinking about faith as you approach your life, no matter what the topic is. This is a crucial topic, right? Can I get an amen about how, how important a, uh, faith is? But when it comes to finances, uh, it's particularly important. What... What part does faith or believe in God you will pr- God will provide plays when you're facing insurmountable financial problems and some of you are facing insurmountable financial problems right I know you are What does it mean to live by faith when you're contemplating have you ever thought about this how do you bring your faith your faith in God into that moment where you're about to sign that contract on that new house or that car or that college education and what this what part does faith play in a person like me and you who are about my age when we're trying to figure out our financial future at retirement okay you know that only 10 percent of americans are confident that they put away enough for retirement only 10 percent to say that and by the way i'm not in that 10 percent Am I right that there's a fine line between faith and panic? So if we want to live the good life, especially when it comes to our financial health, I I think maybe we should spend a few moments this morning, if it's okay with you, we're going to talk about faith. And this is crucial because it's one of those elements, it's one of those beliefs that lie below the waterline of our financial health that informs what's above the waterline. We've been using this illustration of an iceberg. You know, an iceberg is a big hunk of ice, and you can only, when it's bobbing in the ocean, you can only see a small part of it above the waterline. Most of it's below the waterline. So think about your financial health. What's above the waterline, what everybody sees, is how you spend your money, how you save your money, what you do with debt, and how you give your money away. Those are the financial practices that are evident to you and may be evident to other people. But what informs what you do above the waterline is what is below the waterline. And this month, we are focusing on four beliefs below the waterline of your life that shape our financial practices above the waterline. And last week, we introduced, two weeks ago, we introduced the first one, and that is this belief or attitude of stewardship. Stewardship basically says, I believe God owns it all, and I am responsible to care for it. Here's the way Tim described it two weeks ago. He said, a life of financial contentment can only happen when we take our roles as stewards seriously and are carefully thinking about how we are caring for all that God puts into our hands. This is a below the water, and this is a heart-level belief stewardship. Last week, Amy unpack for us this the the second attitude and that is the desire for or the 
belief in contentment. In other words, I am satisfied that what I have is enough. Americans are not good with the word enough. We're not good with that. Do I have enough? Am I content? She pointed us to 1 Timothy 6 where it says true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Stewardship, below the waterline. Contentment, below the waterline in our hearts. And next week I'll be back and we're going to talk about another one of those key beliefs and that is wisdom or attitudes and that's the seeking wisdom. Proverbs 4, 6 says, don't turn your back on wisdom for she will protect you, love her, and she will guard you. We're going to take a look at that next week. But for today, like I said, we're going to talk about faith. What is the link between faith and financial health? What is the link between faith and the good life? And like always at Grace Church, if you come to Grace Church, we're going to look for the answers in the Bible. So grab a Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Page 1016 in our house Bibles. Now, we're going to be all over the Bible today. So, matter of fact, we're going to be in three different places. So, what you want to do is, you know, if you have those little, those little tabs or something, you know, mark it or maybe get your neighbor and put their leg up and he, hold Hebrews open for you or something like that. Because we're going to go from Hebrews back down to Matthew chapter 6. And after a little while, we're going to go from Matthew chapter 6 to Malachi chapter 3. So we're going to be all over. And we're going to go back to Hebrews 11 at the end. So just gear up. Here we go. All right. It's just a short definition from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. What is faith? It goes like this. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Now, let's think of these, think of this definition in financial terms. Side note, it doesn't say any, in Hebrews 11, 1, doesn't say anything about God, does it? We can assume it since the rest of the book of Hebrews is about God, okay? So we're talking about faith or confidence in God and assurance in God. Now, two words I just want to point out. Just look at Hebrews 11, 1. Two words. One is confidence. One is assurance. The word confidence is an interesting word. The root of the word means, this is my take on it. It means the concrete or solid thing under your feet. It's to be supported by something. So when I have confidence, I believe something is supporting me. Faith is is believing that I've got the support and God is under me and, and as a result of know, knowing that, he's, that I'm confident he's under me and supporting me, I can believe what he's going to do in the future for me. And the other word is assurance, and that essentially means proof or the conviction that something is true. So basically, the confidence and assurance of God that what, I, although I cannot see it now, it will actually happen. God will come through. Now, that's the kind of faith, right, that my college friend had. R right? Although some would go, well, that's stupid. Get a job. But what he said to me is, I have the confidence that God will provide for me. So let's not fault him there. I'm going to say that what my friend has, I'm going to call resting faith. Resting as on the solid foundation of God. He had resting faith. But hear me when I tell you this. That's not enough. He was missing another aspect of faith, which I'll show you in a few moments. But let's just, let's not, let's not move off of this. I can, I can fault him and say, well, dude, you're lazy, but I cannot fault him for his faith. He did believe God would provide. Resting, this business of resting faith, that God will provide and you can settle into his support. It, it, there's substance to it. And Jesus talked about it. So are you ready to go to another place in the Bible? Go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. That's page, page 804. Keep Hebrews 11. We'll be back there in a minute. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25, Jesus is talking about resting faith or resting in God's provision. You've heard this before. I, many of you probably have, but let me read it to you again. 
But first, let me get my glasses on so I can do that. Here we go. Matthew chapter 6, where are we starting? Verse 25. <laughs> that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or you have enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Let me stop there for a second. If worrying could add a single moment to my life, I will live forever. <laughs> Those of you that fuss about life like I do. Here we go, verse 28. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. I mean, they don't work. They don't make their own clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. So why do you have so little faith? Good question. So don't worry about these things saying, what do we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But look, your, father, your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's get a T-shirt that says, Today's trouble are enough for today. This is Jesus, my take, this is my take, Jesus describing resting faith, believing that, look, God, first of all, well, here's my definition of resting faith. Resting faith is the assurance that God sees you and knows your needs. Let's just full stop there for a second. Now you, I want you to ask yourself right now, do I believe that the God of the universe sees me? It's kind of a basic question of faith. Do I believe that he knows me, that he's, that he's not disinterested? Here's a second definition of resting faith. Resting faith is the confidence that God cares for you and you are dear to him. Now it's moving beyond the neutral, okay, he sees me and he knows my needs. Not only does he see me and know me, he actually feels for me. He cares for me, and I like this phrase. He's, I, do you believe that you are dear to God? And then finally, resting faith is the conviction that God will provide for you. Ooh, here's the nub of it. Here's the nub of it. Do you believe that God will provide for you? That's resting faith. Even when you look into the future and it's only a hoped-for thing, do you rest in the faith that God will provide for you? Do you have resting faith? Now, I'm going to tell you a story, true story, that just happened about four weeks ago. It doesn't have to do with money or finances. What it has to do with is, is with the provision of God and the fact that he sees us and knows our needs. Okay, so you'll see where I'm going with this story. I was speaking in Columbus, Ohio, about four weeks ago. I was doing a calling quilt. You've seen me do the calling quilt with uh, Cassie on stage here. Well, this church wanted me to do the same thing, so we did a live calling quilt talking about destiny and the future, and it was really beautiful. It was a wonderful thing, and I love this church. Great people. Uh, when I got home that night, there was an email waiting for me from a guy named Mark, and Mark said, uh, Dave, you may not remember me, but seven years ago, I lived in the Indianapolis area, and I attended Grace Church, and I want you to know it changed my life. Radically reoriented my life spiritually being a part of Grace Church, but we moved away. We moved nearer my, uh, my family, and in particular, my niece, who had ALS, and in Amount, some amount of time, we have watched her suffer and we watched her die of Lou Gehrig's disease. It was awful. 
And he said, and my faith in God disappeared. And I became angry with God. And one of the ways that I played out my anger with God is that I stopped going to church. He said, until this morning. And he said, I thought I'm going to give God one more chance. And so I went to church and I opened up the bullet. I went to church that I had never gone to before. And I sat down in the church and I opened up the bulletin and I looked down and I said to the person who's with me, huh, Dave Rodriguez? That was the name of the pastor of the church in Indianapolis. And he said, then I looked up and it was you. And you spoke, and I wept through the entire service, and I felt God had called me there that morning and that he cared about me, and God said to me, you're home. Now, I tell you that story, which is a beautiful story, to remind you that the way God looked at Mark and understood his pain and understood his fury, he cared. God cared, was, Mark was dear to him, and so are you. So are you. You are dear to the Lord of the universe. He's paying attention to you, and he knows your needs. Can you just stop for a second? Just close your eyes. Can you see Jesus looking at you right now? Can you see him looking at you face to face and saying, you are dear to me, I know you, I see you, and my friend, My dear loved one, I will provide for you. Can you see that? I will provide for you. That's resting faith. But, okay, here we go. I don't believe resting faith is quite enough. It's plenty. If that's all you can generate, fantastic. But there's one more aspect of faith that I think is crucial that Go, has to go in parallel with it. Um, and I want to show you, to, this is another aspect of faith in the good life. And can you now open your Bible to Malachi 3, verse 8, page 794, Malachi 3. Because I want to show you another kind of faith that's necessary. All right, before we read this, Malachi 3, 8. Just don't fixate on the tithing business. This is about tithing. It is about financial, but don't get worked up about that aspect of it. As a matter of fact, really what I want you to see are the last five words I read to you. The last five words. Here we go. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, where the prophet Malachi is speaking on behalf of God and says, should people cheat God? Yet, you've cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? Well, you've cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. And here's the last five words. Look at this. Put me to the test. Testing faith put me to the test. Now, I got to tell you, it sounds, it's scary a little bit to say, God, is, we need to test God. But he says it right here. Try me. Put it to the test. Put me to the test. I would say that this is an example of testing faith, and I would suggest this is the thing my friend, my college friend, did not possess. He had resting faith. He did not have testing faith. Here's a definition of testing faith. Testing faith is assurance in God that is verified through action. See, I believe that God will provide for us, but I think that happens as we move, as we move forward, as we make decisions, as we do the wise thing. I do do believe that my, 
friend in college, had he said, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get a job, I believe then the provision of God would have kicked in. I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what happened. I don't remember if he got a job. I don't know if he got a big fat check. I don't know what happened. All I know is I think he was missing this aspect. Testing faith is acting on the promises of God. Yes, God's promises are true. We can rest in them. But we have to move forward and act on the promises of God. Now, you want more proof of this? You, you st- take your neighbor's leg out of Hebrews 11. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 again. Actually, what I want you to look at is Hebrews 11, verse 4. Verse 4. And I'm going to show you how resting faith became testing faith in a guy named Abel. Hebrews 11, 4 says, It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. What was his example of faith? Sitting around and waiting for God to bless him? No, it was acting by giving to God, and I don't think anybody really understands why his offering was so spectacular compared to his brothers but I think it has something to do with with sacrifice on his part I don't know but whatever he did what then evoked the promises of God into his life he practiced testing faith he acted he did something now you want another example look at verse 7 it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood Let me tell you what it does not say, that it was by faith that Noah sat and waited for a boat to show up to save his family from the flood. It didn't happen that way. He built the boat, then God provided the safe passage through the flood. Look at verse 8. Abraham did the same thing. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God and sat waiting for a train to come pick his family up and take him to another land. No, it didn't say that. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. He He could not see the future, but he went believing in the promise of God. Now, you see the difference? Resting faith and testing faith. Do you see how they work? hand in hand, you're going, okay, I think I'm kind of there, but could you be more specific? All right, I'm going to be more specific. I'm going to talk about this in context of finances, and I'm about to step on toes, so here we go. Are you ready for the ouchies? You're struggling to make, to, to make ends meet. I know that. Um, some of you are. I know who some of you are. I know this is a tough time for you financially. Um, Can you believe, when I say that God will provide for you, can you look at me and say, "I, I believe that? Because he will. He will. But there are some steps that you can take as God meets your need. This is one of the reasons we created the care center here, is to provide some of the steps while God is meeting. And by the way, God will meet your needs through the care center and provide a new, and we'll help you get started again. He will meet your needs, but you've got to make some steps. Take some steps. Resting faith, testing faith. Test God, move, and let him, I promise you, he will, meet, he will provide for you you take the steps and watch him show up. Another situation. I know that, too, that many of you are working too many hours. And I think one of the reasons why some of you are working too many hours, one of two things, there are probably more. One is you, you absolutely feel like you've got to make more money, make more money, make more money, make more money. But you working more hours is killing your family and it's killing your spirit and it's killing your body. And yet you're doing that to make more money make, or to climb the corporate ladder so that you can make more money or that you can get a better title and feel better about yourself. Resting faith 
is believing that God will provide for you, but testing faith is stop the madness and cut your hours. Do you really need to work that hard? God will provide, but you've got to take some brave steps. Not only will he provide for you financially, but watch what happens as your family gets healthier. There are some of you that could be way, 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 way more generous in giving your money away, but you don't because you're afraid and you're hedging your bets and you're socking it away for the future. The fact is, you know very well in the future, you're not going to need all that money you're socking away. And right now, there are ways that you could change this world by investing more. And you know what? God will provide for you, but you've got to make some steps and maybe start giving your money away in a way that is more radical, like Abel. Um, how many of you are working, don't raise your hand, how many of you are working jobs that you hate? There's something else you want to do with your life. There's something else that not only you want to do with it, you feel God's called you to something else in your life, but you've hung on, you've clung to that job, hung on to that job which you hate only because of the money. Do you believe if you quit that job and you pursued that thing for which God has called you to, do you believe that he will provide for you? I say yes. I say yes, he will provide for you. But guess what you got to do first? Make the change. Students. <clears throat> I hear it all the time from high school students who don't want to stay in college in Indiana. And there, there's a couple of reasons. And one is, I, I know after you've lived here your whole life, you just want to get away from your family and you think your life will be better if you could just go somewhere else. Uh, or you think maybe if you go to that, that school out of state, you'll get a better education. And what ends up happening is by making that choice, you're gonna pay four to five times the amount of tuition if you go out of state, right? And then you're saddled with that debt for a long time. So students, are you willing to believe that God will provide for you not only will he provide a great education, if you stayed in, I'm, I'm getting real specific here, stayed in state and you paid a reasonable tuition, you stayed in state and as a result of that you get a good education, you got provide, God will provide you a good education and you'll have fun by staying in Indiana. See, God will provide for you but there are some steps you need to take. Maybe it's doing the countercultural thing and then the, I saved the, the most difficult for last, because I'm stepping on my own toes, those of you who are my age, and you're freaking out about the future, about retirement. You don't know if you're gonna be able to afford the kind of health care you're gonna need in the future. So many of us, my age, we're talking about this. By the way, last week, I was with my mother. My mother, two weeks ago, fell and broke her hip and had surgery. So I had to go home to Philadelphia, or not to her home near Philadelphia, and Wednesday morning before I drove back here, I sat having breakfast with her in the rehab place, and I looked around the room at the 30 or 40 people that were having breakfast there, and I freaked out again because I saw myself in the future, and I wondered, can I... Now, I, I should... I'm, I'm getting really personal here, so forgive me. You know, in May 31st of next year is my last sermon here, and you know I'm moving uh, on from being pastor, uh, senior pastor here, but I'm not retiring, okay? For two reasons. I don't want to retire. I've got some things to do. And number two, I can't. And it's that I can't thing that I'm telling you is freaking me out. And I've talked to enough of you my age. So here's what I'm asking of us approaching this point in our lives. Can we believe that God will provide what we need? I'm willing to do the testing part. This, this is where I'm not struggling with the testing part. I'm struggling with the resting part. I am such a fusser. I fuss. I worry. 
can we together hold each other accountable to trusting the God of the universe, the belief that he will provide for us. And by the way, if you hear me worrying publicly, you have my permission to rebuke me gently, but <laughs> rebuke me because I want to believe that God will provide. Do you believe that God will provide for you? Do you believe that the God of the universe knows you? Do you believe that the God of the universe loves you? Do you believe that you are dear to him? Are, we with, are you with me? That you are dear to him? Then can we, can we celebrate his provision in our life? He will be here. And can we be here for each other at the same time? Now look, this whole series, what we've, we didn't want to just give you theory. We wanted to provide practical help. And that's why um, we launched this peer coaching network here at Grace. This is you coaching one another in financial things. I should have expected that what would happen is the demand would be high and we don't have enough coaches and so we're fast tracking about 14 or 15 new coaches to, who want to be able to be trained to help you help each other and so be patient if we cannot slot you with a coach we're going to get it as soon as possible and uh, uh, dozens of people are already saying hey I need some I need some guidance so that's a good thing you can go on our website um, and you will you'll find you can sign up for peer coaching. Second thing is the financial planning ministries seminar that are coming October 5th where we help you plan your future and actually provide for you a free, a, you get a will for free, which is pretty incredible. Of course, I should have suspected that we now have more people than we can handle for that on October 5th. So uh, if you want to sign up for that, the, they have told me with the FPM seminar that they'll come back in December and we'll do another one for those of you who can't do it in October. And then third, that's on the website, and the third is this seminar that's really unique by some very powerful individuals um, who in understand, I mean, they're, they're stupid smart. Uh, Lane Hokema from our Fishers Campus works with Ron Blue, uh, Greg James, who's with the National Christian Foundation, and then Brent Dunn uh, has his own firm. They're, these are financial experts, and they're gonna provide a seminar for those of you who are on the, the end of the spectrum that you have means, um, but you are not maximizing your generosity. So we're calling this a generous destiny workshop for three or four hours on a Saturday morning that will surprise you, helping you work through tax laws and helping you figure out how you can give other than cash that would maximize your impact in the world. You don't want to miss that. So those, those are all available. You can find it on the website. And uh, we'll keep providing this because, um, friends, uh, where else are you going to get the kind of advice and direction for the, your financial health than, than from the scriptures and from your church? We want us to live, we, we should all live the good life, and the good life begins with believing that God cares for us. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.